for coming here. Okay, well, thank you uh, for giving me the chance to speak here today. It was a very enjoyable workshop, um, and it still is, it's continuing. So I'd like uh, to tell you something uh, which I've been doing in the last year with my collaborators from Boulder. And I have to say that I plan to speak maybe for an hour, but I've discovered everybody here speaks for an hour and a half, so I hope I just conform to this rule, and so I'll try to speak very slow and spread it as much as I can for an hour and a half for anyone to join. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, it was mostly, this work was mostly done with my colleagues in Boulder, Mike Fernley and Anna Maria Ray, and then some parts of this work, kind of on more fundamental, simpler level, uh, and uh, we'll see which, which one, the one which I'll start with, was done as a part of a much bigger collaboration which involved about 10 people. Um, okay, so what am I going to tell you today? Let's see. I have basically three messages which I'd like to try to convey. First of all, well, this is the first message. First message is people have been fantasizing about promoting SU2 spins to SUN spins. So theorists have been working for SUN, SUN spins forever because somehow they're theoretically very nice, and in some sense nicer than SU2 spins. But of course there was no physical realization of these SUN spins. There were some approximate realizations maybe of SU4 symmetry, but definitely not of like SUN for generic N. So it turns out that using cold atoms, it is now possible to construct um, SUN spins. In fact, make it in the lab. There is at least three laboratories in the world which already have SUN spins. They're studying them right now. So that's message number one. And so message number two, this means that whatever is your favorite SUN symmetric model or SUN symmetric physical situation, well, quantum, I, I would emphasize quantum SUN symmetric physical situation, now people have it in the lab and they can study this. It's no longer some sort of a theorist playground. It's a really existing system in nature. And so uh, I encourage everybody, if you have such, such a system in mind, well, and there are, there's a whole variety of them, you know, please go ahead and study them because they're no longer abstract, they really exist. And so finally you could ask me, isn't it that people already studied SUN symmetric, at least uh, spin systems, for decades, beginning from the 80s, because that's so nice for theorists to study, and isn't it possible that maybe they already studied all possible SUN symmetric models which ever existed, or whatever, at least uh, generalized from SU2 up to SUN, and all we need to do is to look up what they did, and then just tell experimentalists, and experimentalists will do the experiments. Well, so we discovered that that's not exactly true, and part of it is because people who were studying SUN symmetric models before, they didn't have any experiments in mind. They were just, they had in mind whatever theoretical motivations they had, and often they generalized SU2 to SUN in a way which is completely incompatible with current experiments. In fact, you need to generalize it in a way which those people didn't even think about because there were no experiments to tell them what to look at. And so there is a whole range of models which is unexplored, so nobody knows what they do. And some of them, as it turns out, even do things which people have been looking for, but they're just not looking in the right place. And if you look in the right place, you discover precisely those things. And so we looked at a particular model, which is well close to the models which are, can be theoretically realized, and we discovered that these models realize so-called chiral spin liquids. Well, we already heard Sensel talking about spin liquids, so chiral spin liquids are a cousin of uh, spin liquids. So these are gap spin liquids, which are the spin counterpart of quantum Hall effect. And so they have all these interesting properties, such as fractional availability and excitations, can be used for quantum computing. And so who knows, maybe that's the best way it works quantum computing, is this SUN symmetric um, antiparamagnets. Okay, but so that's just a particular SUN model we studied, and we, in which we discovered nobody has studied before because of the lack of proper motivation. I'm sure there's more SUN models out there, and I encourage everybody to look at what they are and contribute to this new field. But now, let's see. So, um, I could have talked, I mean, there's a variety of SUN models I could have talked about. I'm going to talk about the very specific SUN models which I like, because that's the ones which we studied. But I'll also tell you about how SUN spins arise in the experiments so that you'll see where it all came from. But um, I want to be somewhat more specific, so I don't want to be very general, kind of construct the SUN spins in the most general way possible. Let me do it in a very specific way by studying mod insulators of fermions living in two dimensions. 
And this way actually it connects to what Sensel talked about yesterday, although it's maybe not as rich as what he talked about yesterday, at the same time it's very precise, I'll have very specific models which I'll study. So let's first recall about why high TC superconductors are believed to be antiferromagnets and actually are known to be antiferromagnets at zero doping. So at, this is the famous diagram everybody knows, I don't really know much about it, so it's just my cartoon of this diagram. And so here I, I plot the doping, and here I plot temperature. Everybody knows that at zero doping, which means you have exactly one electron per site, doping on two-dimensional plane, you get um, an uh, antiferromagnet. So let me quickly remind you why it's an antiferromagnet. And so the way this whole thing works is that imagine we have a two-dimensional lattice, and we have electrons sitting on this lattice, and we have one electron per site. And there are strong repulsions between these electrons. So I'm only look at the molecules over here. Unlike what Sensel was doing, if he wanted to come close to the transition to the to metal, I will look at, at the situation when we're deep inside the models, at models later regime. So on one electron per site, there are the spins, the strong repulsion between the electrons, but the electrons can still hop. But if they hop, then you get two electrons occupying the same site. That costs energy, so that cannot happen for too long. And so you have the situation where electron moves, that costs energy, so the other electron has to go back, and then maybe this electron goes here, and then again it costs too much energy, and this electron goes back. And we describe it by the following Hamiltonian. So here are the creation and annihilation operators of fermions. I is a lattice site. So on the site I, it could be a fermion to spin up or fermion to spin down, and these are creation and annihilation operators of those. And so this is the Hamiltonian which tells me uh, a spin alpha fermion on site J moves to nearby site I. And at the same time, uh, the fermion on site I has to move back to, to the site J because we, we, it costs too much energy to occupy two, uh, well, at the same site by two fermions. And so that's the Hamiltonian you get. There's a minus sign because it's a second order process. So you have to do second order perturbation theory to derive it from Hubbard's model. So somewhere there's a Hubbard model, which I won't write, but it's implied here. And so you can rearrange creation and annihilation occurs a little bit by moving f and f daggers, commuting them through, and actually you'll have to do it odd number of times, so the minus sign will disappear. And if you write it in this form, you recognize in this a uh, spin on one half and the ferromagnet. So this object here, it sits on the same side, side j and side j, but it changes the spin from spin alpha, which is either up or down, to spin beta. And this guy changes on the side i, spin from spin beta to alpha. This is like raising and lowering the creators, essentially. Some or all possible combination of those. And so, uh, with a little bit of imagination, we can rewrite this as a real spin going into spin. So, but I assume that everybody knows this, but you know, if I go through this like that, I will avoid questions and I'll generalize that to SUM. Okay, and that's why these guys are Heisenberg and the Fermi. And uh, well, constructed out of SU2 spins. Now, what about this SUN business? So basically, in atomic physics, in the last couple of years, people came to the following realization, which somehow wasn't appreciated before. So all the atoms which were cooled down until recently, including those which Martin Zweilein was talking about a couple of days ago, they're so-called alkali atoms. They live in the first column of the periodic table. They are the easiest to cool for a variety of reasons. But let's look at atoms which sit in the second column of the periodic table, which are usually called alkali and earth atoms. So they're different from alkali. And so those atoms have not one, but two electrons in the outer shell. So alkali one electron, but alkali and earth have two electrons in the outer shell. And if you look at the outer shell configuration, typically what happens is that in the ground state, two electrons want to sit in the lowest possible state, which is S orbital. And they have two spins, spin up and spin down, which pair up into spin zero, again that causes the least amount of energy. And so the ground state of such an atom has total electronic spin equal to zero. And total angular momentum also equal to zero, because both electrons sit on the S orbital. That's we should contrast that with alkali, where there's only one atom, uh, which typically sits on the outer S orbital, so angular momentum is still zero, but there's a spin one half. Here there is no spin and no angular momentum. And as a result, there's no way for these atoms to talk to the nucleus spin. So all these atoms uh, have nuclear spin, and normally nuclear spin talks to the electronic degrees of freedom, while nuclear spin dotted into electronic spin interactions called hyperfine interactions. Here there is no hyperfine interactions. In fact, there are, because of high order processes where you kick those electrons 
to some highly excited state of them, take them back. But these are strongly suppressed. It's a very tiny little fraction of anything else we have here. So essentially, nuclear spin is completely decoupled from the electronic spin. That's the major, no, the real thing which happens in these alkaline earth atoms. Now, um, there's also another aspect of it which actually is important for what we've done, but um, for the purpose of this talk, you, if you want, you can ignore it. I won't really make much of an emphasis on that. Uh, so there's also an excited state of such atom, where you take one of the electrons and promote it to p orbital, and then the angular momentum of such a state is now one. One electron sits here with angular momentum zero, one sits here with angular momentum one. But somehow, because of some hold rule, the spins then arrange to form total spin also one. And then angular momentum one and spin one combine together in a total spin zero. That's the lowest energy configuration of such electrons. And so that creates an excited state whose total angular momentum, electronic angular momentum, uh, angular momentum plus spin, this total thing is equal to zero. And again, it does not talk to the nuclear spin. So uh, if you remember atomic physics, you know, I studied it, I guess, at some, at some point, but then I completely forgot. Now I have to relearn the, you know, the symbols and learn delicious quantum mechanics and the appropriate chapter explains what the symbol means. But S means angular momentum L1, 0. P means angular momentum L1. This means that, uh, well, this 0 means the total spin is 0. So that's J. So combined L and S is 0 because it's 0 here and, and 0 here. But this is 2S plus 1, which is 1 here and 3 here. Spin here is one, spin here is zero. For us, the most important thing is that in both cases, J is zero, and J being zero means nobody talks to the nuclear spin. Okay, so we could use either of these two states. By the way, this state is, uh, even though it's excited, it's not going to decay into this guy, because all decays go with a change of total angular momentum. And if, you, if you remember selection rules, what was always carry a unit of angular momentum away. Because of that, this guy well, it can decay, but again, by some very complicated uh, second order process, and in, in practice, it lives forever. And so we can use these atoms in either of these two possible states. Now, as I said, that's not super important. You can forget about that state, just think about them sitting in the ground state. But it is important uh, if you understand everything which we've done. And so, uh, let's see. And now, here is the interesting idea that this large nuclear spin, which can in principle be large, it can play the role of the SUN spin, where n is the number of total number of rejections of the nuclear spin on the z-axis. So if nuclear spin is i, then n is 2i plus 1. So if i is 9 half, then n is 10, for example. And that's the example of strontium 87, whose nuclear spin is 9 half. OK, so that was pointed out um, by this big collaboration, of which I was part, and then also intended to by these people. And I guess, yeah, since I have an hour and a half, so I can say also, for, I can make also for comments, so I can make a comment that's on the archive that paper is before this paper, so wonders about the years. Okay, <laughs> so now here's an interesting twist. So for this entire scheme to work, we need to have some nuclear spin. If nuclear spin happens to be zero, it's not going to work. There's nothing to play with, no nuclear spin. Uh, and now it turns out that all bosonic atoms with even number of electrons have total nuclear spin equal to zero. It's like a theorem in nuclear physics. So uh, these are called even-even nuclei, nuclei which have even number of protons and even number of neutrons. So, and here we demand to have even number of electrons, so that J is zero. So the even number of electrons implies even number of protons. Now, if you want to have a boson, you also need to have an even number of neutrons. Then you get an even, even nuclei, and those uh, have nuclear spin equal to zero. At least in their ground state. They have an excited state of nuclei, but you probably don't want to work with those. You're no longer an atomic physicist, you're a nuclear physicist. Uh, but you can have fermionic atoms, which have n larger than 1. And here is one example. Strontium-87, yeah, it's a fermionic isotope of strontium. Its nuclear spin is equal to 9 half. And so we claim that it realizes SU10 symmetry. Now, at this point, usually many people complain. They say, this is not SU10 symmetric spin. It's just SU2 spin, just very large. So what's the difference between the two? And so let me try to convince you that this is indeed SUN spin and not SU2 spin. And I'll do it uh, to make my life easiest on the example of that same mod insulator, kind of uh, deep mod insulator limit. Um, of the Hubbard model, except I'll be now working with strontium ions instead of working with electrons. 
So imagine I have a two-dimensional plane, and I place in it strong ceramics. And electronically, they're all in the ground state, but they have this nuclear spin, which can take one of 10 possible values. And so each strong atom is characterized by the direction of its nuclear spin. <coughs> can I ask a next question? So can you just remind us what, 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 what's the difference? Because otherwise, for me, it's not easy to follow. Because uh, what's the difference be be between uh, SU2 and uh, SUM? Well, um, because you were mentioning that people were blaming something. Right. But could you How about I will write something on this very slide, which hasn't yet appeared? which will precisely point out the difference. And, yeah. and so you will see it in just a second. OK, but so let's place strontium ions on, on every side of the slide, just like we placed electrons before. But electrons had a spin, which was either spin up or spin down. Strontium ions have nuclear spin, which is 9 half. It takes 10 possible values. And so I try to represent that by pointing, well, these arrows are now nuclear spin. Now, I somehow wanted to show that this nuclear spin can take one of 10 possible values, and I wasn't sure exactly how to do that. But I just made it point not only up or down, but also sideways. That implies that there are many different values which nuclear spin can take. And then now, let's imagine that, again, we have a Hubbard model, which makes those guys move around. But uh, it's a Hubbard model that's very strong repulsion between strong atoms so that it costs a lot of energy for them to occupy the same site. And so they start moving, so one moves, and the other moves back, and then maybe this one moves here, it costs too much energy, so the other, the other one moves back. And now by complete analogy with how we did it last time, we can write down a Hamiltonian which describes this. And not surprisingly, well, it will take the following form. So we'll introduce a creation operator, just like we did it with electrons, which creates a strong steel atom on a side I with nuclear spin alpha. This alpha takes n possible values, n possible projections of the nuclear spin. Just like for electron, alpha took two values, spin up and spin down. And then I'm going to write exactly the same Hamiltonian. That's what I had before. Except now alpha and beta don't go just over spin up and spin down values. They go over n possible values, n possible projections of the nuclear spin. And now if you stare at this, this is SUN symmetric. Hamiltonian. It has SUN symmetry, not just SU2 symmetry. So again, if you look at it, all it does, it changes, uh, take an atom on the side J and changes its spin from alpha to beta, and on the side I, which is just nearby, changes its spin from beta to alpha. Uh, and so you can call this raising operator, and you can call this lowering operator. And by the way, here you can see the difference between SU2 and SUN raising and lowering operators. SU2 operators can only lower spin by one. Suppose I have 9 half spin, so if a lower operator can take a spin whose projection is 9 half and change it to 7 half or to 5 half. But these guys, they can change uh, the nucleus, they can take nucleus spin with any projection and, to ch and change it into any other projection. And that's why this has a CUN symmetry, not a CUN symmetry. Do you like uh, assume that the atom physically hops from one side to another? Yeah, but that's what they do. If you but, put them on optical lattice. Yeah, oh, but how do I do? Probability would be probably very small. Compared. Well, you, you can control it by changing the height of your optical lattice. I see. So people already can place uh, atoms. Uh, I mean, they can. I think that the fermions are already say a model So mm -hmm. there's no question they can do this. They can control. So they, with lasers, they can create an optical potential. They place these atoms in this potential. They can change its uh, strength to make it deeper or less deep. Sorry, yeah, I was completely confused because you started from cube rays and somehow ah. I was envisioning a physical atoms hopping in the lattice. Oh, no, no, now I'm right. going to okay. hold that. Okay. So I, I just drew an analogy. An analogy. So I did it with electrons just because I wanted to draw an analogy of what happens with cube rays. But now I have these strontium atoms. They're no longer hopping around some real crystalline lattice. They move around in an optical lattice, but they're still described by the same Hubbard model. Okay. So how, how do you know that the, the J's don't depend on the spin at all? Is there well, a good reason? Yeah. That's exactly because nuclear spin doesn't interact. Mm -hmm. J's will depend on these indices alpha and beta if somehow interactions between the atoms. So you're saying the interactions is always occurs from the elect like the scattering means will just be from the electrons basically? Yes. And all the all right. will be the same. So that's why you have the Yes. Mm -hmm. When you when two atoms are on the same side, which is where interactions come from, mm -hmm. right? When they're on the same side, they repel each other. And how much they repel each other does not depend on what the nuclear spin is doing. It only depends on what the electrons are doing. Nuclear spin is completely inert. Now, there is some residual interaction between nuclear spins. For example, there's a direct dipole moment, nuclear dipole moment interaction between two nuclear spins. 
but it's a tiny quantity. It has to be a structure constant and mass of, um, you know, mass of nucleus compared to the mass of the electron. You can calculate it. All of these numbers come out to be about 10 to the minus 6 the direct nuclear spin interactions with each other will be 10 to the minus 6 compared to electronic interactions. And that's like the worst case scenario. It could be even better. So in principle, if you take into account all these subtle interactions, this J will depend on the nuclear spin, but it will depend on it in a very, in a very weak way. Okay, and now you can see that this does have a serial symmetry. For example, if you take this within this Hamiltonian, you take this guy, and you multiply it by an SUA matrix, clearly this is invariant. It's constructed in such a way that it's invariant. Uh, and so it's SUA symmetric, just like before it was SV2 symmetric, uh, electronic system was SV2 symmetric. And again, let me emphasize that it is a large spin. It's not an SUA spin in some sense, it's an SV2 spin, but there's an additional symmetry which appears because it's not, the spin directly does not interact with anything. And because of this, there's an enhancement of symmetry which gets promoted from SU2 to, to SU1. Okay, so now we can create SUN symmetric antipermagnets. In fact, not only antipermagnets, I just gave it to you as an example. But work with anything you like, go back to Hubbard model, it's going to be SUN symmetric. You can just have those atoms floating in free space, you'll get SUN symmetric interactions. Uh, and so people realize that, and they now do experiments. And so just to um, convince you that it's not just empty words, it's really happening. I want to show you at least some of the papers which came out recently. Um, so here is one paper. That's the group from uh, Texas. Uh, this is taken from the archive, so maybe it's already published. But at some point, those papers will come out very quickly. So I have to, I just, I have to grab them from archives as they were coming out. So this one was on May 6, 2010. They can take strontium-87 and cool it down, and um, they didn't place it on optical lattice, but they can cool it down to regenerative temperature. So C over TF for the Fermi is 0 0.5. So clearly uh, they did it, and since they did it, and they've invested time to learn how to cool them, I'm sure now they'll proceed and do some SUN experiments with real SUN uh, It's not just cooling down from the matter for fun. So here is another group uh, by uh, the group Leader is Florence Schreck from Innsbruck. <coughs> and so here is his paper dated June 8, 2010. And so they can also cool down strontium atoms. And uh, in fact, on top of what these guys can do, they can also select, pre select um, the fraction of the population with different projection of the nuclear spin. So they can, for example, choose them all, all nuclear spins to be in some direction or in some other direction. Um, in fact, now these guys, since this paper was written, have already placed uh, those atoms on the lattice. And so, you know, these things are happening very quickly. But just to give you an idea of how quickly this is happening, on May 6th, I happened to be in Innsbruck. And suddenly this paper, uh, this paper appears on the archive. And so Florian Schreck gets all, you know, upset. And he says, we had our strong cooled cool down to one of the for the last month, but I just didn't have time to write it up. So this guy beat me. So he dropped everything and started writing this paper. It came out a month later. But so, for us here, is that's good that there's a competition, which means that they'll move fast and they'll try to do some real um, SUN symmetric experiments. So here is another group. So these guys work with ytterbium, which is technically speaking not alkalineous, uh, but it does have two electrons in the outer shell. Um, and so there's an isotope ytterbium 173, whose nucleus spin is 5 halves, which means it's an SU6 symmetric atom. And in fact, those guys know that because they put it in their title. And uh, SU2 comes from another isotope of ytterbium whose nucleus spin is one half. And so they, those guys can do mixtures of uh, ytterbium, which is SU2 symmetric, and ytterbium, and, uh, ytterbium, which is SU6 symmetric. Although I'd say SU2 symmetric is not that interesting. You, know, you can just have normal spins. And so if these ytterbiums, it will be automatically SU2 symmetric. And now these guys, uh, they, uh, and that is May 21st, 20, so in between those two other papers. And so they cool down the ytterbium atoms to form the degeneracy, but they also place them on an optical lattice. And in fact, here just to give you an idea, so this is time of flight experiments of these atoms sitting in the optical lattice. So those who are used to this kind of pictures, recognize the first brilliant zone. My understanding that the temperature is high, it's not a band oscillator, it's just that some lowest band randomly fills uh, the fermions at some fraction, but kind of like the entire band is, is filled uh, with the fermions. Um, 
And so, well, essentially they're now ready to study Hubbard model, as you say, symmetric Hubbard model, as far as these guys are concerned. Uh, there's, of course, issues of temperature. It's very hard for these guys to cool down on lattices. It's now a major issue also with SU2 symmetric ions, not just SUN. Uh, but at least some, uh, well, at least they can do a lot of oscillators. So maybe they cannot go down to a magnetic scale, but uh, not yet at least. But they can, I think these days they can do a lot of oscillators. And so, presumably, that's what they're working on right now. I'm sure this was two months ago, so they haven't wasted their time. And um, I'm not sure what they were up to, but probably something is happening. So my message is that Experimentally, this is a field which is developing right now. The experimenters are excited. They invested time, energy, and money. And so I'm sure that they'll do more. And we as theorists have to tell them what to do. Otherwise, we'll be doing things we won't like. We don't have to do interesting things. We have to tell them what are those interesting things. OK. And so now, uh, let me just conclude maybe that part by saying that uh, clearly, as the world of SUM physics is now accessible to experiment. You can study SUM covered model, SUM metals, uh, model oscillator transitions. There are always 1D SUM iterable models which people study. Uh, and you know, now they can realize those uh, models uh, experimentally. Well, of course, there's SUM antiferromagnetism, which is what I want to talk about. And you know, other things which might occur to you, you can put them here. So clearly, you know, something is happening. And, the idea is to try to, well, as theorists, to try to understand what would be the interesting things for the experimentalists to do to study SUM invariant physics. And now, um, I want just to talk about SUM and the Fermagnus because that's what we've done, and I, I don't know why, but maybe because it was the most natural thing for us um, to first think about when we realized that there is this new, new field of SUM symmetric spins. And now, um, as you know, the Ferromagnus has been studied by many people in the past, uh, partially because when n is large, somehow SUN uh, and the ferromagnets are more tractable analytically than SU2 counterparts. So you know, the reason why Central uh, gave us a talk yesterday with all sorts of variational wave functions and uh, some sort of pachyphilia ansatz, this is because there's no way to solve the problem. You can only uh, make various guesses of how it should behave. But when n is large, often you can actually calculate and find out what's happening. And so maybe, in this case, who knows, maybe, well, in this case, we have n as large as 10. Maybe that's good enough for, for us to use one of these larger methods. And so that might be a hope. But it also could be that whatever we know about SU2 physics is no longer holds true when n is large. Maybe we'll get a completely new type of physics, which now experimentalists can study. And basically, the first question is whether it's possible to um, look at what people did in the past and use it as a guidance to study SUN symmetric physics. And so if we concentrate just on these antiferromagnets, which I want to talk about for the rest of my talk, then uh, there's, well, there's a lot of work uh, which started in the late 80s, and so people who jump started it are such different reader on the one hand and Affleck and Marston on the other hand, and then there's many, many other people who followed. Some of these papers have thousands of citations, well, hundreds of citations. This is close to a thousand, this is only 300 for some reason. Maybe because this was more attractive for fancy people than this. But, but from the point of view of antiferromagnetism, they were similar. Uh, and so uh, those people studied the CUM symmetric antiferromagnets for large n. So can we learn something from these papers? And so it turns out that, well, we can learn something from these papers, but we cannot just take them literally. In a the sense, they studied SUN models, which are interesting, but might not be that relevant for. Uh, for cold atom physics, or for the kind of physics which I've just described. But that was precisely because they did not have in mind multilanial atoms. They had in mind generalizing SU2 magnets to SUN in some way which, which they liked. And so let me tell you uh, what happens and why the kind of generalization of SU2 to SUN they did uh, probably is not suitable for our purposes. Well, I mean, we could talk about how experiment cold atom experimentalists could actually do it the way those guys did, but it would be very hard. On the other hand, we could do something simple, and that is new physics which have not been studied. And so, um, so I have to tell you the difference between SU2 spins and SUN spins. And so let me first tell you that if you take SU2 and the paramagnets in two dimensions, you have these arrows. I mean, these are now electrons again. I can compress, for example, or atoms. Uh, 
whose nucleus still only has two projections, like in the Japanese work with the Terbium 171, I think, which had nucleus still one path. And so if we have an end experimenting of that sort, well, this was studied mostly numerically. Essentially, in two dimensions, you can write this Hamiltonian, but you cannot study it analytically. You can study it numerically. And numerics confirms that this forms in Yale states, the, the prototype and the paramagnetic uh, ground states. Uh, and so this Yale state has a long range and the paramagnetic order. So this spin points up. On the average, this spin will point down. This will spin will point up again, and so on. Um, so this is a well known fact, which I guess was subject of debates for a long time until. Now it's more or less established, uh, as well, well, theoretically, numerically, as well as experimentally. But now let's think about what happens if we take these SU2 spins and replace them to, by SU2 spins. Will we get also some sort of Neal state? And so it turns out there's a one crucial difference between SU2 spins and SU2 spins, which is if you have two SU2 spins, they can form a singlet. You can combine them antisymmetrically and you get a singlet. And so we know how to do that. One SU2 spin and the other SU2 spin, you combine them, and this object is a singlet. But if you have SUN spins, that doesn't happen. And again, we can see why. In fact, you need N SUN spins, at least N, to form a singlet. Just like here, you need at least two, or you can also have four, six, or more. Here, you need N or two N, or three N, and so on, to form singlets. And we can see why. So again, imagine that I have SUN spins, which is essentially the same thing as here, except here, uh, each spinner has index which is either spin up or spin down. But here each spinner has an index which goes over n possible values, which is like n projections of my nuclear spin in my strong surveillance. And if I write down an endosymmetric combination, this will not be a singlet. It will be an endosymmetric n by n tensor, which has n times n minus 1 over 2 components. And if n is equal to 2, this is of course 1. There's only one component, up, down, minus, down, up. But if n is greater than 2, there's more than uh, one component. So it's not a singlet, it's really a new type of representation of the CUN group, which has no analog for SE2 uh, group. Uh, and now you could, for example, take three spins and combine them into anti-symmetric rank 3 tensor, and then this will have n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 over three factorial components. And if n is 3, this is 1. But if n is larger than 3, this is not 1. So again, if n is larger than 3, it's not enough to take 3 as you spins to form a singlet. By the way, you can also combine these things symmetrically, but that definitely will not form a singlet. I'm just trying to, to take the closest route to get a singlet. But if you are willing to go all the way to n spins and combine them all together, then clearly this will be a scalar. So each of these alphas should take a value from 1 to n, and it's completely asymmetric. So each alpha has to be different from any other alpha. So if this one is 1, this one is 2, next one has to be 3, last one is n, that's the only component this guy can have. All others are related by permutation and minus signs. So you need to have n spins to form a singlet. So that's a crucial difference between SU2 and SUN. And now, now I come into what people did back in the 80s when they studied SUN uh, symmetric antiparamagnets. They designed those models in such a way is to be able to form singlets from two nearby spins on the lattice. And that was because they had in mind cuprates. So they said, and cuprates is very important because of all this Nelson's blown picture, but I'll come to that in a second, uh, a little bit more. But so it's very important to be able to say at least that two nearby spins will combine together to form a singlet. Um, and so if we generalize it to SUN, to by brute force, that won't be true anymore. So let's do something more tricky than that and do it in such a way that they still form singlets from two nearby spins. And they accomplish it in the following way. I'll describe it, well, they describe it in the language of representation theory, but I'll describe it in the language of my atoms. Place m atoms on one side and n minus m atoms on the other side of your optical lattice. And then two sides together can have m atoms, and so two sides can come back, uh, fuse together to form a singlet. And so uh, you can, for example, if you work on the bipartite lattice, and today I'm going to talk exclusively about square lattice, or no triangular lattice, or any other kind of business. So two-dimensional square lattice is bipartite. It has odd sides and even sides, and all even sides are only connected to odd sides, or have only odd neighbors, and all odd sides have only even neighbors. And so you can place, for example, one fermion, one spin, on uh, even sub lattice, 
and it's n minus one on R sub lattice, and then you get a model which reads in such state. Or you can put equal number n over two terminals on every side of the lattice, and then you'll get a model which marks the anoplic state. Either way, you can take two spins and fuse them, or two sides, I should say, two sides, and make them together form a single. Of course, each side has many spins. So, are you talking about the SPN group? No, SUN. SUN. There will be no SPN here at all. What Adam realizes is SPN. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the issue. So, I'm asking what do you, what do you mean by... When I talk about this study, but it says SUN magnets. So I'm referring to SUN studies. There are also separate SPN studies for SP2N studies. Uh, but I will not to, um, to refer to, the, to those. Okay, and so now, essentially, if you take this special model, many fermions on the same side, arranged according to the rule. And then you can take n to infinity. And then you can actually analytically compute what the center ferromagnet is doing, <coughs> unlike in the case of SU2 spins, where you cannot do anything analytically. Here it's a tool which this guy's developed, how to take large n limits. It works beautifully. And they discovered that the ground state, in fact, in either case, doesn't matter which of the cases you take, the ground state is so-called balanced bone solid. And here is what it is. It's my cartoon of how it looks like. So you have these even sites on which there are red spins. Red spins is really M, Fibonacci atoms sitting on the site. And then there are odd sites on which there are N minus M, Fibonacci atoms sitting. And somehow the spin of these guys combine with the spin of this guy to form a singlet. So this red thing is like a singlet forming uh, or a bomb. And then on two nearby sites, they also fuse together and form a singlet. And then these guys form a singlet and so on. And they cover the entire lattice with these bonds. And so it's not any L state, unlike for couples for SU2. For SU2, we have the L state. This state does not have any magnetic order, but it breaks translation with variance. So, um, well, so it's a different kind of state. And now, after they did this large M study, other people came along and uh, they also studied what happened at finite them. Well, one of the questions was if N is 2, we know we get. In the L state, if n is infinity, we get this state, so what happens when n is in between? They can only do it numerically, and uh, I think even now people are still talking about this, and essentially what they discovered is that if n is 2 or 3, you get the L state, and if n is 5, 6, 7, and so on, people more or less agree to get balanced bond solids, and if n is infinity, we know that from the population. And finally, if n is 4, there are some debates about what's going on. Some people think it's a spin like that. But a very large n. You can make this unit divided by n expansion. Yes. And mm -hmm. people do the settle point approximation. Well, yeah, it, is, it amounts to a settle point approximation. In fact, I'll talk about it a little bit later. So I'll, I'll, I'll but talk about how what I am it. wondering here, this I understand, yes, but what I am wondering is uh, in, in which aspect what you are doing in this very large group of people in which uh, aspect this is different from what, what these other people have done. Because if the system is SUN symmetric, okay, I have the Hamiltonian, I have an action, and then I act and I obtain the result. Well, basically I'm coming to this. By the way, just to set the record straight, I'll say that uh, when, this, when I talked about this large group of people, it was just the fact that there are SUN symmetric atoms. When I talk about SUN symmetric and the thermagnets, that's the work with my thermally and Anna Maria Ray, and all these two other people I don't know. Yeah, I think so, wouldn't you expect some even, even odd effects in Kaplan? Uh, well, they don't see it here. So I don't actually, I'm not sure why I would expect it. Because, uh, well, one of the wave functions would be valid if not, you can't set m equals n over 2 for the odd. Yeah, okay, well that's a good point. So if m is equal to n over 2, then you only have to can look at e of m. You cannot look at e of m. Um, uh, when, in fact, when we do numerics, what I should have done, I should show not just this as a function of m, but also a function of, as a function of m. And then there are points, there's a whole, it's a two-dimensional uh, plane. There's a phase boundary which separates the neon from the other one solid. And there's a specific point there. So in fact, when m is equal to 4, it's the case where m is 2, which I think is now believed that maybe it's a still liquid. But M is one or three, and then it's four. It's um, actually not sure what it believed. I think it's believed to be in the L state, but I don't remember. But isn't it? Okay. Yeah, I mean, okay. So isn't the point is that for these representations, the the ones that were done earlier, the point is there's an exactly solvable limit n infinity, and you don't get a spin liquid, and you right. get this crystalline state, these valence bonds. Yes. Solid, in contrast to what 
you guys is coming. Well, I am coming yeah. also with Dunlop. Yes. But, okay, but. Yes. But also, I mean, to, uh, uh, to answer Jorah's question, so look, if you look at what these guys are doing, they're placing m fermions on one side and n minus m fermions on another side. Now, you could do it in optical lattice, but it's not an unnatural thing to do. You'll have to stuff lots of fermions on, on each side. In fact, this will lead to all sorts of instabilities. The experimentalists are going to put one fermion on every side. And in that way, that's why what we are doing is completely different from this. So this will probably not be realized experimentally. But, because a uh, large number of fermions have to stay Do you sides. mean that you put a constraint, that there is no more than one or two fermions no, I, per side? We we'll put exactly one fermion on every side. That's what experimentalists will do. And These then, guys in their theoretical study put m and n minus m and played with this n. Okay, okay. so in your case, although the, the number of spin states is very large, let's say 10 or something, uh, you get not more than one fermion. On the other side, yes. Whatever the projection is. Right. In fact, exactly one, because we like to study models later, so we have one on other side. And that's what, this, what my next slide says. Oh, we can, I can have a question. Yeah. How do you define the L state for n larger than 2? It's a good question, I don't know. Uh, so, but in well, my opinion, you, you simply cannot define it because uh, uh, the crucial point about the L state is you have just two uh, internal degrees of freedom, right? So it's either 1 or 2, 1 or 2, check your board. Well, it, but I can tell you though, so it, there's a way to define it. For example, if, so if you have SQ3, it means each atom can be in one of three possible states. Right. And I imagine that those somehow cover the lattice in some sort of pattern. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Yeah, that would be the analog real state. In fact, it does happen with SU3 SU and the Fermanians. Uh, there are people who are doing numerics and they believe that so there, there should be things. some special pattern which would involve all n components. Yes. Okay. Well, Definitely SU3 will have triangular lattice. That's what happens. Yeah, yeah, triangle yeah, yes, has yes, like yes, yes. You know, red, blue, yes, and three, three is very natural for triangle. Mm -hmm. But certainly, I mean, if you go to large, large dimensional representation, then it should look classical, and then you can just just arrange these vectors to alternate. Well, yeah, yeah. the vectors in multi dimensional Yeah, well, they're fine, but okay, some but components of it will alternate. That's right, but you have to go to this large representation of the camp. In fact, I have the plan to talk about it. Right. You probably know part of that story. Uh, but this, it's my thought that you actually want to study experimentally. But anyway, so, Let's go back to this slide. It says all of this, which is this m n minus m business, is not relevant for us because experimentalists are going to put one, maybe two atoms on every side. So they have the strontium atoms, these are SU10 atoms. At most, they can place two of them because if they place three, they generally believe that this will be unstable because uh, this is um, what is it? atomic recombination processes where things simply collapse. And so um, they'll most likely have one. They'll, they'll start with one. Maybe later they'll put two, and that will be the end of it. So they will not be able to put, in case of strontium, one atom on one side and nine atoms on the other side, I understand, to get the kind of states which, uh, for example, Sajid Devan Reed talked about 20 years ago. And so clearly, if we want to make progress and tell experimentalists what they should expect to see, we should think about what happens when you have one atom per side, and not the kind of problem which uh, people looked at before. And now, people didn't look at this problem before, as it turns out. In fact, one of the big shocks for me, I was an outsider in this field, and it was a big shock that even though there's this huge body of literature, nobody ever bothered to ask the question, what happens if you place one SUM atom on every side of a lattice? Well, there were some people who looked, but they kind of did a half-hearted work. So there's a uh, relatively recent work of Dan Arovas, and he talked about, uh, well, maybe we'll have this maybe one atom per side of strong so Well, he didn't talk in terms of strong so he was just interested in SUM. And he said, well, we know that we need N or a of two atoms per side. We need N over two sides to form a singlet. So maybe the entire lattice, just like in the valence bond system, we have valence bonds, here we have valence N simplexes, or N clusters. We prefer to call it N clusters. So this is like a cartoon of uh, uh, N cluster which involves um, six sides, maybe it's as to six theory, so we take six sides and, from, and from how they form a singlet, and another six sides form a singlet, and they cover my entire lattice. That's a possibility, it's a potential state which might arise as a solution of SUM symmetric in a fermagnet if you put one fermion on every side. And in fact, so Arovas coined the term 
simplest solid states, which is, uh, if this guy gets covered by patches which arrange themselves in a pattern, but each patch is n signs which fuse together to form a single. So it's a possibility, but it turns out that at least for n sufficient large, we never find it by at least trying to actually solve uh, Heisenberg Hamiltonian. Presumably, you can get these, uh, you can actually get these if, if you either consider a generalization of square lattice to go on some other lattice and you can maybe get this. In fact, we know that you can get this. Um, or you can add extra terms to the Hamiltonian, not just Heisenberg terms, but other terms. And you might stabilize this kind of states for n sites for the singlet. But as it turns out, um, and I'll talk about it in a second. Um, so you. Can I ask you a question at this point? The point on the Hamilton, because there is something which seems to me like a very a special picture, like a trivial picture of the Hamiltonian, because looks like your Hamiltonian can preserves the number of atoms in each component. Yes, absolutely. So it, it just what comes from microscopic dynamics. Right. So you can, it's like you have an n component system with a sort of special well, interaction. But that's exactly, it's like a z component for SV2, which is preserved. And here you have n minus one such object. That's very right. common for SUN symmetric systems, actually. Yes. In principle, the Hamiltonian uh, are compatible with SUN symmetry can be much richer. But because of this microscopic uh, yes. dynamics, you are bound well, basically to, to this uh, maybe unpleasant well, feature. Well, OK. But so it is a feature of Hamiltonian because, because there are n minus 1, what is it called? Is it called Cartan sub algebra of SUN, right? It has n minus 1 generators, which all commute with all generators of SUN. And so that's why there are n minus one conserved points, which is number of atoms with particular projection of nuclear spin. And if you think of it in terms of nuclear spin of strontium, I just said that nuclear spin does not interact with the fact to anybody. So if you have 10 atoms yes, spin yes, up, yes. 10 atoms spin down, 10 atoms spin to the side, the number will not change. And so when you work with these antiferromagnets, you can work in different sectors. So many of these guys, so many of these guys. Now we always work in grand canonical ensemble, which is, we say we'll choose the one which is the lowest energy. So for which I, I believe you need to take equal number of every population. That's what we get. But in principle, you can study other sub, sub sectors with other numbers. Okay, but a very uh, uh, simple question. Can I treat this system as a, a, a system of n minus one component bosons with some fine-tuned interaction? Well, so you mean uh, hardcore bosons? Yeah, yes. yes, you can do that. In fact, we prefer to think of them as fermions and to describe the kind of states that they have. In terms of, say, simulation but without we'll a sign problem on a bipartite lattice problem, okay. we can think of them as bosons. You can, well, it it's an analog of uh, Schrinker bosons for, mm -hmm. for SUM. You have n species of bosons as hardcore constraint. Right? Yeah, you can do this. Okay. Uh, by the way, we're very much interested in possible ways to simulate this. So if you have any insight, I'll be very happy to hear. Yeah, we can discuss because my naive uh, just feeling is that the, your specific Hamiltonian should be like uh, n minus one component bosons. If I'm not well, they are, but they interact in some way. But okay, the well, is not a problem. The only problem is the same problem, isn't it? Okay. So, um, yes. Okay. Well. Usually people say that there is a sign problem. Oh, Maybe they think okay. in terms of fermions. I don't know. I think, think in, in terms of models you have. Okay, but so let me now try to argue what actually happens here. So um, this and simple to people postulated by robots that they, they, they only occur in some special cases. <laughs> Most of the time they don't occur, and I would, would like to tell you what occurs. And one of the questions is whether something like Niel state, which, which we just were discussing a second ago, if that might occur. And so now I have two slides which discuss this, which I believe are too technical. So if you don't like them, I mean, well, you're welcome to ask questions, but it's okay. I mean, they're completely disconnected from the rest of my talk, so they're very important. Uh, so basically, I'm, I'm, I will now try to argue that Niel states, which is a state in which these n components or n possible states, nuclear states of my atoms, form some sort of pattern, you know, 1 to 3, 1 to 3, 1 to 3, or something in space. Uh, whether such states are possible. And I'm going to argue that probably not. And the way I, I'm going to argue is I'll look at a classic, classic, classical version of this model. So let's look for a second uh, at what we usually do when we have SU2 spins. We imagine spins as being little arrows. Well, really, just classical arrows which point in some direction. And, well, we can think of interactions as being scalar product between these two spins, and our spins, uh, Hamiltonian is trying to minimize the scalar product. 
uh, well, actually maximize right, the hardest work, minimize. Um, yes, but so uh, one way of thinking about that is to represent the spin by a complex spinner. So in fact, what I'm doing here is I'm replacing spins by classical arrows, but then I somehow replace those arrows by a complex classical um, number, even though it looks like a quantum spin one time, but it's really just a function, z alpha, it's a two component spinner, uh, and it controls the direction of s, and s a molecule is a unit vector, as we all know. And so if you do it, you can map the Hamiltonian, which uh, I discussed before, the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, it takes a little bit of work, but you can write it in this form. It's a spinner on one side, dotted with spinner on the other side, nearby sides, absolute value squared. And so from here, it follows right away that you want to minimize the energy of this Hamiltonian. You want the z's to be orthogonal to each other. So that's the minimum, absolute minimum of that scalar product. And so one z is one zero, which is like s pointing up. And the other z is zero one, which is s pointing down. That's exactly when this product is zero. And that's the minimum, absolute minimum of the Hamiltonian when it's written in this form. And that's how we know that this classically, if you think of the spins as arrows, they probably want to try to alternate. Maybe what Neil was thinking about, Neil you know, proposed Neil state. But no, of course, quantum mechanical is something more complicated happens because such a pattern is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. But at least classically, there is this argument which tells us that yes, maybe something like that happens. And so we can try to generalize it to SUN. Now, instead of two dimensional vector, we now have an n dimensional vector. And write exactly the same Hamiltonian. But now we observe that, uh, so this z is that try to be orthogonal to each other. And if z's are two component vectors, it's very easy for them to be orthogonal. One is one, zero, the other is zero, one. But if these are n component vectors, if one is one, zero, 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 the other can take n minus one possible directions. Uh, and so there are many ways to make one spin to be orthogonal to another spin. And so uh, now what you could try to do is you could try to ask, what are the total number of possible configurations of these z's, which live on sides of the lattice, which minimize my Hamiltonian? And so in case of Neal state, essentially there's only one, up to rotations, up, down, up, down, up, down. But here, if you know that one is up, the other one can point in all sorts of different directions, so maybe there are many such configurations. And indeed, what you can do is you can count total number of degrees of freedom, which you can vary to maintain h to be equal to zero. And this will tell you the uh, classical ground states energy manifold dimension. And you do it by counting number of degrees of freedom similar to what Moisner and Chokra did in some classical, I guess, firechloid model. Right? Maybe somebody here remembers exactly what it was, I think, firechloid. So you say that, well, 2n minus 2 real degrees of freedom, each z is a complex vector of length n, but it's, I mean, of size n, but it's length of one, Phase is irrelevant, so it's 2n minus 2 number of degrees of freedom, and if ms is number of sides of the lattice, that's the number of degrees of freedom we have, which we can vary. And then if we demand that these guys are all zero, that gives us two constraints per bond, although not all of them are independent, so there might be fewer constraints, and so you can now calculate the ground state degeneracy. And degeneracy becomes microscopically extensive if n is larger than 3. In fact, you can prove that even when n is equal to 3, it's still microscopically extensive. Only when n is 2 is not extensive. So, and this is, um, this shows that when n is 3 is not extensive because it's a cru very crude estimate. And so, well, what does it tell us? It tells us that um, even classically, if you think of those spins as being arrows, there's no reason for them to order. So in the case of the yield state, once one points up, the other one has to point down to minimize the energy. But here one points up, and the other can point in all sorts of different directions. And the third one can point also in all sorts of different directions. And so even classically, they probably won't order. Now, there might be some order by disorder. You know, if you look at fluctuations around the classical configuration, maybe they'll order. Nobody has done this kind of calculation. And if anybody is interested, you're welcome. You know, that's an open problem. Uh, but the bottom line is, we think that probably Magnetic order is unlikely. So probably for all these SUN systems with one Fermin per site, and I emphasize I'm looking at one Fermin per site, not at what size the three that Optic Marston looked at. So probably we will not uh, see any L states. This is uh, or an analog of the L state, but for SUN. Um, we'll probably see something else. And now the question is what it is that we're going to see. And so now I'm coming to um, maybe the main part of the part which we've done. Uh, which is the applied larger methods, which is actually what I, I tried to tell you from the very beginning. So you want to take n 
very large, and we know already from all this previous work, that's exactly when you have a little control methods. You see, you can try to apply them here and see what happens uh, to these electromagnets. And now, well, here is how we're going to do it. You know, here I want to try, so this is one of the messages which I do want to try to convey. And even though it's a very simple message, I myself, uh, it took me half a year until I was comfortable repeating this. That's not how, at least for me, it's hard to absorb. So I tried to repeat it several times. So the problem is that you could just take n and take to infinity and place one fermion on every side. And but only make n large. Which is kind of a natural thing to do in a strong stem. One, one strong stem per side, and the stem. Maybe it's sufficiently large n, but maybe you can take it to infinity and calculate everything analytically. But the thing is that it's a problematic limit. Because as n is increasing, the number of, of atoms which, require, which are required to form a singlet is increasing too. And you think that this is a defining property of SUN system. How many sites I need to have to form a singlet? And if the number of sites is increasing, maybe there's no good limit. Maybe each time n is increasing by one, we form a new state. And increasing by one, another state. And there's no convergence of that. It's just, you know, those states keep going one after another, and they're all different from each other. And we don't see any limit from n state into infinity. We'd like to do things in such a way that as n is increasing, things are convergent to one good, well-defined state. And so to do that, we propose to do the following. It's essentially a generalization, a very simple generalization of what Marston and Upton said, but it works. Which is, let's put n divided by k atoms on every side. So what do I mean by this? So that's the main message, which is, to me, it always requires <coughs> to myself 10 times so I can get this down. So if I work with strong thin atoms, I can, I, I imagine that I place one strong thin atom on every side. And uh, it's n is as you tell. Okay, but what I'm proposing to do is now, well, theoretically, so I cannot do it um, experimentally, but I will imagine that instead of having SU10 atoms, I have SU20 atoms. But I have two of them on every side. So that I still need to have 10 sides to form a singlet. So before I needed 10 sides with uh, one atom per side of SU10 atoms, having two atoms per side but of SU20 atoms, I still need uh, to have 10 sides. Or I can take SU30 atoms, and I'll put three of them on every side. And so this K now, essentially what N used to be, what well, N was 1. So originally, M was 1, and N was 10, and K was 10, obviously. Now I'm increasing N, and I'm simultaneously increasing the number of atoms on every side, in such a way that the ratio N over N is kept fixed. And that ratio is what n used to be. So strontium, if I'm talking about strontium, this k, I want to keep it 10. And I want to keep increasing n and m simultaneously uh, as to keep the ratio n over m to be the same and to be equal to this 10. And so from now on, I no longer work, well, uh, what, what the kind of state I'm describing is controlled not by n, but by k, because n is taken to infinity, but k is kept fixed. It's to be equal to 10. k is the number of sides I need to form a single. Am I right that at this step you lose the c control in terms of your original Hanukkah? Absolutely. Now you are yes. studying some model and which can or cannot, uh, yes. or may or may not be relevant to your original Hanukkah. Right, and that's why I was so much interested in possible yes. numerical approaches. In the end, I'll show you a phase diagram where we'll, I'll highlight what we know and what we don't know and where the experiment is. This is more or less the POTS model, right? Oh, yes. POTS model. It's the K-state. Well, uh, it's the N-state POTS model. Yes, but it's a classical model. Yeah, that is, of course. But uh, I thought you were, or, I thought you were arguing more or less classically here. No, but I only had two slides which were classical, and at this point I can forget about them. They don't exist anymore. I'm going back to my quantum model. Can, can I return? Because it's, 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 uh, the POTS model was really the question I was uh, going to raise at the very beginning of the, uh, when you wrote down your Hamilton, because it's very typical for the POTS model when you have many different states and only similar states interact and the other ones are just uh, all symmetric. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. is this is the quantum POTS model. Mm -hmm. This is more or less the quantum POTS model. Yes, that's okay. what was So I don't know how thinking. quantum POTS model is defined. I know well, how I don't know. Okay. POTS model is defined. <laughs> we can call it quantum POTS model. But now you're thinking of, POTS mo of the relevance of POTS model. Because of the classical POTS model. Yes, to your quantum right. system. Uh, yeah, so well, okay, I, I can start speculating. I mean, usually if it's a classical model, it goes to quantum. But n equals 4 is special. n equals 4 is special in the POTS model. In the POTS model, yeah. yes. Well, here, you know, who knows? Maybe it's related because when we have something special happening when k is equal to 4. 
But I mean, to tell you the truth, right now I don't see any equivalence except our Hilbert space maps into uh, uh, space of states of the path model. But the path model has a Hamiltonian, we have to compute the partition function, classical mm -hmm. Hamiltonian, classical energy. Here I have a quantum Hamiltonian. It's not only the, 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 the space of state, it's, only, uh, it's also the type of interaction, because it, what's characteristic for the path model, if you have a similar guy, they there is one constant, uh, uh, if they are different, it's uh, yet another one, yeah. not, nothing in between. And sort of, yes, there is some flavor of that here. Yes. So of course, we have a Hamiltonian, which what it does, it actually switches states on sites. But, you know, what we do is if we have one spin here, another spin okay. here, they can they exchange. Right. Right? So if it's one and the same uh, state, it's one story. If they are two different, it's yet another. It's exactly yes. uh, the flavor. But of yes, the there is some flavor of past model. Yes, yes. It, it's possible that maybe it can recast in some version of past model. But my guess is that it's not a solved version of the past model. Otherwise, somebody would have pointed that out by now. Okay. But so yes. But as I said. All that stuff, you know, it is a way to approach this problem, um, which would improve what we've done. We've only done one little thing. And it would be really great because that, even that little thing shows there's something going on here which people have not, uh, they have not observed before. Okay, but so what we're going to do is we're going to place n over some integer atoms on every side, and the integer controls what we started with. We started with n being k, and then we take n to infinity and simultaneously increase the number of atoms per side. And, uh, and then we can study this. And here is the answer. It turns out that if k is equal to 2, that's much enough like n over 2 atoms per side. Two sides are required to form a singlet. We will get the balanced bond state. If k is equal to 3, we can do the procedure and we get uh, Arovas' uh, simplex solid state. If k is equal to 4, we also get Arovas' simplex solid state. And I'll talk about that in a second. If k is larger than 4, we get a completely new state, which is actually a spin liquid of a certain type called chiral spin liquid. And essentially, the rest of my talk is about how we get this and what this implies. Uh, okay, so uh, let's look at this. So here is uh, one slide which actually has equations on it. And so uh, essentially, this is how such large n approximation is done. And uh, well, we have not invented it. That's basically out of uh, at Marston. They did it in the 80s. And they probably relied on somebody else, but I mean, it's pretty straightforward to do. So you start with this Hamiltonian, where alpha and beta go from 1 to n. I just wrote from this convenient way with a minus sign in front, but remember to change the sign by reshuffling f's. So here the reshuffle can such a way that there is a minus sign in front. It's also usually convenient to stick it 1 over n, because if you don't stick it 1 over n, then there's no larger limit, no, uh, n goes to infinity limit. So you stick it this, uh, this n, and then what you do is you write down a uh, action, so you write in terms of coherent state path integral, written here. So on every side i, we again have these fermions. And then we want to enforce that there is n divided by this k fermions on every side. And then on top of it, we take the Hamiltonian, which sits here, with the coupler with Haber-Satonic field. And the way this is done is that Haber-Satonic field, is, it kind of lives on a bond connecting side i and side j in such a way that the fermions now hop from side j to side i. and each of them, for each, uh, well, as they hope, they preserve their spin. And that allows us actually to use larger limits, or larger methods in this method, I mean, in this approach. So uh, there are these n fermions, which move around, and I'm starting over them like this. And of course, this chi squared. So if you integrate out chi, you go back to the Hamiltonian. What is in the little brackets is the original Hamiltonian, just looking this way. And so then what you can do is you can integrate out fermions and observe that the effective action will be proportional to n. And so when every time you have some kind of effective action which is proportional to n, all you need to do is to apply some point approximation that n is large, and just study what comes out. So basically, what are you going to do? You integrate all these f's, and then you vary with respect to chi, and you vary with respect to lambda. These are your two parameters over which you are now integrating. This is a round multiplier which enforces that I have n over k atoms on every side. And this is this other hubbard knowledge field, which if I integrate it out, gives me this. But if I differentiate with respect to it, I get this kind of equation. So differentiating brings down that bar f. And differentiate with respect to lambda just tells me that, uh, well, I have n over k particles per side, or for each component alpha, I have exactly 1 over k particles per side. Mm -hmm. so all around are 1 particle per side. And the concentrate of each component, it's 1 over k. 
So it's uh, one thin, one particle of particular spin component on every three sides. Let's say, but could you in principle also break that symmetry or not? Well, that There's comes out symmetry. from. Um, you know, the chi yeah, so j, for, it work? chi j, for example, could be alpha dependent or not. Yes, in principle, you can break it. So in principle, it's the sum of our alpha. Okay, but we're looking for symmetric states. So mm -hmm. that's like precisely the states which live in this subsector where you have uh, n over k. But you explored, you know, did you explore that axis or you just, by fiat, put it on the. Yeah, I think we did not explore this axis. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, and yeah, there might be something happening. Like, for example, the spin liquid could be unstable to that axis. No, I think that we explored, at least locally. Well, now that I'm saying that, I think if we know that it's stable globally. So I think it's that right, that right. Axis. Yes. And the other question is, uh, the fermionic kinetic, not kinetic energy, but that Barry's phase term, PQ dot term, F, F dot term. Mm -hmm. So that... Uh, oh, but, yes. Okay. So where, So this is your original Hamiltonian, but somehow the... Right, so when I go to Lagrangian, the, there's nothing funny going on with the, you just get a standard F, DT, DT, F term. Yeah, well these are fermions. Yeah, you just encode the fermion like relation. relation. Yeah, it. just, just enter the usual criteria state path integral. Okay, but so now I have to solve these equations. And, uh, well, so these are difficult equations. And it's actually very hard to solve them because the sky might vary well, the chi is little on bonds, and they might vary in some complicated way. And what this equation is actually telling us is that chi takes some values, some midfield values, and then fermions move in the background of these hoppings. So chi's are like hoppings, but these hoppings arrange themselves dynamically in a certain pattern, and then fermions move in that pattern in such a way that this expectation of fermions moving in this pattern is equal to chi themselves. And so you can actually argue that what this means is that fermions are trying to arrange their hopping in such a way as to minimize their energy. So they try to create a band structure to hop around in the most efficient way. That's one of the possible ways of interpreting these equations. And so now, if we manage to solve these equations, to find such chi's and to find such um, lambdas, in principle, this is lambda, it depends on lambda. To find such chi's and to find uh, such lambdas, then, um, so what will we do next? Well, then we'll say that we'll do a you know, perturbative expansion around the seven points. So we'll say chi is equal to some seven point value times fluctuations. And this, I think, sense of natural class time. So, I mean, this kind of approach is very common to uh, people doing spin liquid, except they not always they take large limits. Sometimes they just write by fiat this kind of seven point equations. Or even they don't even write seven point equations, they just say chi takes some value. You know? Let's go from there. But here we have a real seven point equations. So, um, the most the softest fluctuations in chi will be in the phase of chi, not in the amplitude of chi. They take the least amount of energy. And so we can write down chi as being several point solutions times fluctuations. And these fluctuations look like a gauge field. That's that value gauge field which Samson talked about yesterday. And we can just calculate the effective action which depends on this gauge field, which will describe for us what happens to our system. And so this is the program. And now we have to uh, realize this program. And for that, we need to study these equations. And now it turns out it's, uh, it's hard, but it was possible to do the following. So let me now describe what the solution of this equation is, but I will not actually tell you how to solve it, because that was essentially the, the biggest and hardest part of this work. So if k is equal to 2, that's the case when you have n over 2 particles per side. That's exactly uh, marston applet case, and we already know the answer, because marston and Applick worked it out. So what happens is that this chi is such that it's non-zero only along some bonds, which appear highlighted in green, and chi happens to be zero everywhere else. So these bonds, chi is zero. And so fermions only move around within each little cluster. And that's exactly the balanced bond state. In fact, you can, uh, you have to do a little bit of work, perhaps, but you can convince yourself that in the language of spins, this describes two sides which fuse together to form a single. And so, well, that comes out as a solution of those seven point equations, and in fact you can prove that this is the correct solution, which is the absolute minimum of those equations. Okay, but uh, nobody has, st has studied what happens when k is larger than two. We have n over three particles per sec. So we looked at n over three particles per sec, and we discovered the following, that chi arrange themselves in such a way, well, you might think maybe it's gonna be a simplex state where maybe three sides 
on the singlet, and then you would imagine maybe you have some triangles. So I cannot have triangles as a square lattice, but maybe two lines, two bones connected three sides together. But actually what happens here is you have six bones, so chi is non-zero, and they're connecting six sides together. So it's like six spins connected into a single, or combining into a singlet. You could have done it with three, but square lattice doesn't like it. They prefer to have six. There's one additional interesting subtlety, which is uh, chi is positive on all of these bonds except one, where it's exactly, uh, well, it's negative and opposite of magnitude, so it's as if it's a pi plus square to each of the single squares, and that's important because somehow Fernand like doing that, that minimizes the energy. That simply tells us about how precisely those six spins combine into a single, because they can do it in mean, two different ways, and that's one of them, which was the most relatively favorable. And again, we can prove that this is a solution of the equation. Um, as an absolute, you can write down a functional which, whose minimum gives you those seven point equations, and this minimizes that functional. It's a global minimum of it. Okay, now you can go to k equal to 4. And again, here, not surprisingly, you discover squares. So four sides fuse together to form a singlet. And uh, again, all other bones are, are zero, the green bones are non zero. And we get uh, this simplex solid states, where you have squares uh, on every side. And, well, and so, again, in some sense, all we're doing is generalizing one bond, but in a situation where we have more than two sides, which form a singlet. Okay. So, excuse me, how do you, how do you continue that to equal three on the lattice? So, what's the next one? Well, horizontal or horizontal? like this, and then like that. Not, 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 not horizontal, because what's the difference? Well, so that's actually a very good question in the sense that I'm lying a little bit, partially because I want to try to finish soon, but I'm lying the following. I don't know how they are arranged. I don't even know if they form a solid or they're randomly scattered to our rise. It is because we only studied the solution of the seven point equations, which don't care how those guys are arranged. There are many solutions. As long as each side of the lattice is a part of such an object in some way, this will be an allowed solution. To really see that they form some kind of pattern, you have to look at fluctuations. And we have not done it here. Now those guys did do it here. It was very hard work, and they discussed. They discovered that they form precisely this kind of lattice. Here we don't know, but it, it's going to be some pattern. Uh, presumably, no, I mean, for the, for the k equal four is obvious, but in the k equal three, you can have right. parquet type or, or uh, stripe type, or you know. Yes, but even k equal to four could be the way I show. It could be this square and this square that could alternate in a checkerboard pattern. Right? Maybe this um, column. Should be shifted down by one. But they'll be the same, right? So well, if, you, if, you, if you continue on the infinite place. Uh, well, it depends on, I guess, lattice breaks rotation symmetry, so it's not going to be the same, right? Because it's going to be tilted. Oh, okay. so this is like this, and then these guys are like that, and this, the next one is like this, and this. I would think it's different. It's like every other row, uh, col column, okay, it's column shifts down by one. But it's, I would think it's different. But so, but I don't know. So for that, somebody needs to study fluctuations now. Knowing from how hard those guys work to study fluctuations, it's probably not easy, and we didn't have enough motivation to study it. But it is an open question: what happens in this case or in this case in this large M limb? Okay. But now we come to the most interesting part: k equal to five. So the important thing here, though, is that we were able to prove that each of these configurations is the absolute minimum of the functional we have to minimize to get those saddle point equations. So we know that this is the solution of saddle point equations. There's no better solution. Uh, but when we came to k equal to 5, somehow we were not able to prove uh, what's going on. We could only make conjectures, which we checked numerically. But by numerically, I mean solving those saddle point equations numerically. But I can, and what we discovered, and that essentially was the result of the numerics plus additional analytical work, which um, confirm that this doesn't contradict anything, is the following. So again, basically what is happening here is that fermions are trying to arrange for their hoppings in such a way as to minimize the energy. And when k was 2, 3, and 4, they did it in a very strange way, by breaking lattice into patches, and each fermion just hopped within each little patch. And each little patch forms its own little band structure, and that's very somehow convenient for fermions to live with that band structure. But as soon as you go to k greater than 4, this somehow is no longer possible. And instead, the fermions do the following. They arrange for hoppings in such a way that there is a magnetic field going through every plaquette. So remember those hoppings, they were just variables over which I was integrating. They were complex variables. In principle, they could take values which correspond to complex hoppings. And as we all know, complex hoppings means magnetic fields, more or less. 
And so what happens is they put two pi over k flux to our little plaquettes. And when that happens, the entire spectrum breaks into k lambda levels. Each of them has a finite width. And now, um, if you think about what's happening here, each species of fermions will have you know, n species of fermions with different projections of spins, but each of them has a filling fraction 1 over k, which I think I mentioned before, because it's one fermion per size, but um, if you concentrate on a particular spin component, it will be only each k side that is occupied by that fermion. And so, um, what's going to happen is that, uh, because, well, since it's still the fraction is 1 over k, they're going to, going to fill the lowest lambda level, all n of them. The first one will form the lowest lambda level, the second one. And that's very convenient for them, because they're separated from the rest of lambda levels by a gap. If it turns out nobody else can do as good as uh, formation of lambda levels to minimize the energy of these fermions. Hey, I missed, there's, are there k fermions? No, sorry. Huh? How many fermions per site? Okay, so we have uh, n over k fermions per site. n over k. n over k. So k is kept fixed, but n is in principle taken to infinity. But then, and the flux to each. So now side. let's think about what it means for each species. For each species, there are n species, n over k per site. So but that means one, one over k for every species, which means each species occupies one case of available band structure. And that's exactly one lambda level. It's one k of all yeah, possible states. Right. There's two pi over k flux per one over k fermion, which is which is two pi per one. Right. Okay. okay that means that each uh, they all go into the lowest lambda level. Okay. okay. And so that's the result of uh, this calculation. Now again, uh, unfortunately, it's very hard to do this kind of energetics because there is no analytic formula which tells us how wide is the lowest lambda level for a given k. It has to do with half standard butterfly. You only know what happens when k is very large. But generally, you just have to do it numerically. And so we verify numerically that uh, there's nothing else which gives us lower energy if k is, uh, well, is 5 or greater. Also, if k becomes very large, you can use approximate formulas which tell you what lambda levels are doing. In that case, you can actually prove that this is the best possible solution uh, as k goes to infinity. Although it's, it's a very strange limit. First, m is taken to infinity, and then k is what we take. But so all the evidence shows that this is indeed what happens. The lowest energy state is the state with the magnetic field going through every plaquette. And so, um, so we've obtained this kind of states, and now the next question is, what does it mean? Um, are there, so what's the next best uh, state? Next best state um, has to do with some sort of very strange clusters. Lots uh, of things form clusters. Yes, and some kind of a charge density wave kind of thing. Maybe I should call it spin density wave, actually. Um, yes, but this thing beats those things, those other systems. Although, you know, by, by an amount which is proportional to J times some number, and that number could be one tenth, could be one hundredth, depending on J. The way of um, lowering the end, there's this uh, collaboration, quantum collaboration, then maybe the next best one can, can be. Due to power fluctuations? Yeah. Well, the thing is that those guys have very nice fluctuations. Mean, this state is gapped. And so the fluctuations somehow, I don't think they carry that much energy. So I don't think that um, this state will win. Those other states. I mean, you, you think it's just energy crossing? Yeah. 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 To zero authority, just took you know, the states for n equals to, for k equals to 3 crosses, the, or k equals to 4. To five, let's say, because 4 is. 4 and 5 cross. No, well, the states, if, as k is increasing, you get completely different states. But suppose k is 5. So k is 5, let's say, though, the best state is the magnetic field. But there are also other states with some spin structure, for example, which have high energy. But if you study fluctuations, who knows? Maybe those spin states start winning. Now, that's not impossible, but probably unlikely, because fluctuations are gapped up. In fact, in both states. How large is gap to the next best state? It's larger than 1 over n. It's a finite gap. Well, it's a number. So it's j, the coefficient, so times some number. So you wouldn't expect that the fluctuations could bring yes. it down in one of our expansion. Your, I think, safety, your prediction. Well, but fluctuations for both states, for both the pattern and the magnetic states, they're all going to be one of our expansions. So in that sense, maybe they are the same order. Oh, but you're saying that since they are uh, proportional to 1 over n, but this guy that just j, no, yeah, that actually is a good point. Because the other 1 over n, but the gap is finite, that's insignificant. Yeah, maybe that's a good point, actually. I like this argument. 
That's why you do it that way. So the all fluctuations will be suppressed by one over m. Uh -huh. After all, some point here is a good approximation for this very reason. But the difference in energy between this oh, guy and the sure, next sure. best guy, they're not. Okay, but all of this only applies when energy large. We're talking about saddle points. Okay, but so now we've got this interesting state where somehow the saddle point is such that we have magnetic field per every, every plaquette. And now we can talk about what kind of state this is. And it turns out that this state was actually looked at. It, people didn't know how to arrange for things, so that saddle point gives you magnetic fields. But they speculated about what would happen if that happens. In particular, if you look um, in the book of Eduardo Fratkin, he has a whole chapter talking about what would have happened if we had 2 pi over k flux per plaquette in this kind of formalism, although he didn't know how to get there, how to get this far. And so now we basically can open his book and uh, learn about a state called chiral spin liquid. So uh, it turns out that this state is a chiral spin liquid. The chiral spin liquid is different from usual spin liquids because um, it has a gap, unlike gapless spin liquids. Well, I would say no more than that, more than just a gap. Yesterday we heard about gapless and gapless spin liquid. This is a particular gapless spin liquid which breaks time reversal invariance. It, it really does because there's magnetic fields, so it has to break time reversal invariance. Uh, it also breaks parity. Um, and so this kind of state was first described by Kalmer and Laughlin on this slide, where uh, it's impossible to find a picture of Kalmer, who knows what happened to him, but then we'll check zero and no now, so we can put the pictures on the slide. And so it was pro proposed independently by Kalmer and Laughlin, and then a little bit later by Wen, Wilczek, and Z. In fact, those guys did it in the language of quantum Hall effect, which is a little bit more sophisticated, but these guys did it precisely in the language I just presented, which is magnetic field per plaquette. And what they showed is that, um, well, so chiral spin liquid can define it as a state without any magnetic order, but breaking uh, parity and time reversal invariance. Um, so some people say it's not a spin liquid because spin liquid should not break any symmetries of the Hamiltonian, as Sensei said yesterday. This guy does break parity and time reversal, even though Hamiltonian is symmetric and parity and time reversal. So, um, well, and one thing I should say that local Hamiltonians whose ground state will be chiral spin liquid were unknown. Because, well, people look for them, but they always involve some horrible spin spin interactions over long distances. Especially, I would say that the work which, is more, uh, which I know best is uh, a whole series of work by Martin Greider, who looks for this kind of uh, Hamiltonians, but he didn't find any local Hamiltonians. And so now we have a local Hamiltonian. And now, what exactly happens here? So remember, we found the saddle point, which was chi such that it was a magnetic field per plaquette. So now it makes sense to look at fluctuations. So let's write chi as this magnetic field times some fluctuations. And let's um, expand in, in, in powers of these fluctuations and look what comes out. And fortunately, we don't have to do that because this was already done. As I said, you can, for example, open Eduardo Fatkin's book or any other book you like or any other paper of late A's where people speculated what would have happened if this was such that it corresponds to magnetic fields. And so it turns out that this action is a charm simons action. It has to do with the fact that these uh, fermions have a whole connectivity. And the coefficient here is n. It's kind of interesting. It's one over n expansion. That's why the coefficient here is n. So it's a charm simon theory on the level n. And fermions can acquire fractional statistics. And we all know what happens when you have trans Simon's theory. And remember, n is taken to infinity, so somehow the bigger is the n, the better is the fractional statistic, the more fractional it becomes. Here I have a little slide which explains what fractional statistics is, but I'm sure everybody can know. Mm. So this is what happens with the, uh, with the fermions we have here, and they become fractional. Um, one question is what kind of experiment people would try to do to actually measure this? And so what we propose to do is to look at holes in this lattice. So before we talked about more than three, now let's go to it, create holes, and uh, so here we can follow standard results. In fact, one little difference is that we don't have to postulate anything here, it all comes out of the large M expansion. You can write F as this product, plug it into the Hamiltonian, turn the crank of the large M expansion, and discover that F indeed breaks into a column and a spin on, and those dog interact, which is fly apart, and each of them is fractional even though F itself, in some sense, is not fractional. And so that, uh, and on top of it, Holon responds to external potential. So if we're aware, we take a site of a lattice and 
for example, increases some energy so that the hole which was created by removing atom is attracted to that spot, the spin is going to run away, but the hole will stay there, which will be a hole, and that hole will be a fractional particle. And then we can move it around and see its fractional statistics, and here I have a cartoon of how this will happen. On the cartoon, I lower the potential, but maybe I should actually raise it. So how spin runs away, and only a hole remains, and the hole is going to be fractional. So I'm obviously not going to explain how this happens in the calculation, but all I'll say is parallels to what Stanton was talking about, except you can do it as a controlled large M expansion. You can see that this is indeed what happens here at large M. Now, um, I should probably go now to try to finish it quickly, because as I promised, I've been talking for an hour and 25 minutes. I think that means I have five more minutes. Okay, I should stop. So I'll just tell you very quickly that it's also possible to have a Roman billion kind of spin liquid if you work with the two electronic states of these alkali neutrons I talked about, the ground state and the side state. That's the only time it's important for me. So when you have two such states, if you recall, I was in the very beginning, an hour and a half ago, when I have two such states, then um, I can create, if I work hard enough, I can place two strong steel atoms on every side. They form some sort of combination, which is symmetric with respect to these guys. And you can show that instead of the abelian Schoen-Simon theory, in the end of the day, you get non-abelian Schoen-Simon theory. And in fact, it's a non-abelian SU2 level N theory. So if you continue following what people are doing with fractional statistics, you'll uh, recognize it's a very nice fractional statistics because in the end, it's very large. You can have a fractional statistics of a very uh, rich type. You can do topological quantum computing with SU2 level 10. Uh, now, uh, I'm not going to open the describe this. I have a slide about what non-abelian statistics is, but I assume that everybody heard about it. We have particles described by wave functions. You exchange them. Wave functions get multiplied by matrix. The type proposes this. And now we all know that lots of people give a lot of money for this. And this guy, for example, contributed quite a bit of money. He started this organization called Microsoft Station Q, which is on campus at, uh, uh, close to KTP in, in Santa Barbara. Uh, and uh, their goal is to work on topological quantum computing, essentially on how to get non abelian transcendent theories. Um, and the kind of topological state they usually concentrate on are so-called SU2 level 2 states. So here I try to put a... Uh, this thing actually knows a little bit about quantum computing. So everybody says, it would be nice to have SU2 level 2. SU2 level 2 is realized, for example, by the famous 5 over half after the state in the whole effect. It's also realized by Majorana Thurmans of the type which we just heard about earlier today. Uh, and so it's an interesting state with non abelian statistics, but it has a very poor non abelian statistics. In particular, it's not enough for universal quantum computer because it's two makes it non universal. So you want to make it larger than two, at least three. The bigger it is, the better. But obviously, uh, we can do it to level 10, as we saw, because Strawson has n equal to 10. So, um, well, who knows? Maybe that's the way to build a nice, rich topological quantum computer. Okay, so with this said, let me go back to the abelian case, which is the only one which I really explains. And now, I'll, uh, this is the last thing which I want to do, is to show you a phase diagram where I point what we know, what we don't know, where the experiment is. So here's, uh, this is the best way, at least after some practice, I decided that this is the best way to present this diagram. So let's present it in the following way. On the x-axis, I put number of atoms per site. So then we will have one. But for my theory, I should be able to have two, three, and so on. And here I put this number k. And again, k is a very strange number. It's not really a critical number. It's, it's a ratio of n divided by m. So uh, a good a kind of limit which I want to consider is m taken to infinity. m taken to infinity, k kept fixed. It says convenient for me to plot k, even though k is just that ratio. It's not anything by itself. And so one thing we should know is that if we have one atom per site, and if k is 2, that means n is 2, so it's SU2. That's the SU2 usual antiferromagnet, that's the Neal state. But if n is 2, 2 atoms per site, and k is 2, that's n equal to 4. That's exactly what funny things are happening. And as soon as we go to 3 atoms per site, we get valence bond salt. And what people knew before, what I showed actually earlier, is that everywhere along this line, you have valence bond salt to the right of this line, line 2. Okay, now what we learned today is that if you take m to be very, very large, and you start increasing k, and you go above 4, 
you switch to chiral spin liquid. But chiral spin liquid lives here for large values of m. So that means n is also large, m is also large, but their ratio is five or larger. And that's chiral spin liquid. Now, where is the experiment? Well, experimentally, they can put one atom or two atoms per site. So let's look where the experiment lives. It lives in this part of my diagram. So obviously, uh, this diagram, I mean, both k and m are integers, so it's really this point. And experimentalists can do experiments on every of these points. So if it's one strong thing atom per site, they can take m to be equal to four, or um, uh, if it's one per site, they can take m to be equal to one, three, four. By the way, they, they can choose m to be anything below 10 by selectively populating just some states. That's exactly the kind of questions Maurice was asking over there. Yeah, so anything uh, with n less than 10 is allowed. If m is 1, that means k can go all the way to 10. But if m is 2, k can go all the way to 5. And larger than 2, it's, it's not feasible experimentally. So experimentalists live here. What we know is that Niel is here, well, this bone solid is here, chiral spin liquid is here. What we want to know is what's going on here. And now it all depends on how the phase boundary is shown. If the phase boundary is like this, we have topological quantum computing here in two cases that I had to do experiments and get uh, everything we want. But on the other hand, who knows? Maybe the phase boundary goes like this. So this is only L states. Mental case is not happy. But that's probably not likely because I, I spent some time arguing that probably as soon as you start increasing M, you will not get any L kind of order state. So that, I don't believe this can possibly happen. But who knows, what might happen is that there is an additional line here, and there's an extra phase here. In that case, I would say, uh, well, maybe Bill Gates is not happy, but maybe it's still some new phase, which experimentalists might be able to observe. They'll take it there strong soon, put one other precise, and it's 10. And why, you, why there is no connection with that VBS? Well, uh, yes, and I'm, I put a question mark, meaning maybe it's a VBS, in which case there's going to be a connecting little thing, but I was too lazy to do the animation to move those lines apart. But yes, maybe it's connected to this video. Yes. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> just too much. <laughs> Frankly, I wouldn't expect anything uh, really non-trivial because as I said, uh, looks like the system is just, uh, can be mapped onto the bosons. Because you see, if you have, uh, say, one atom per site, you can uh, take, uh, say, one, the component number one as a vector, and your particle is a pair of the whole of this background component and get another. Before leaving, I would say that I disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe before leaving, you will, uh, I will explain why. It's so disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, and, 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 and you have a component model, which is a pair of the whole and, the, uh, and uh, yet another particle. And two terminals are, are a both. So my point is that this hemoglobin can be mapped onto n minus one component in both, unless you dope it with holes. If you dope it with holes, yeah, let's not dope it for now. Well, I would say yes, all of these can be represented in terms of bosons, but that doesn't mean it's trivial. These are hardcore bosons, and also they so my, my, my intuition tells me that hardcore bosons are trivial. So actually, uh, Neil state means that these bosons are both condensed. While Bell's bosons are actually... Wait, 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 Neil, that means that they're not condensed. That no, they they're they're form a solid. Nail, nail, they're condensed. Nail, they're condensed. Nail means come on, check it out. Solid for spin, for spin one half. Nail means check it out. Solid. No. Yes. Well, they're both condensed, and the bottom modes are. Also, these are different. That's the bottom modes. Then you finish. S D equals plus minus nearly bottom zero one. That's the bottom. Plus. Gaussian modes. That it's a separate issue. It's an issue of symmetry, but it's a, essentially a solid. It's a diagonal order, you know, of, of, of diagonal order. S Z. Hmm? Well, it depends if it's S Z. No, or because it's S Y. Um, okay, so the <laughs> state does break translation variance in some sense, but it only breaks it in a very weak sense of the word. The most important thing is it has a magnetic order, so that means there are some expectations of okay, okay. okay. non-zero. Okay. Does that mean to have? I mean, here I'm. You know, I don't really know much about this stuff, but so many people work with it, and that's what they always say, so I kind of grew to believe it. And so that's why I'm so confident in saying that I'm sure that <laughs> that's what's happening. But, you yeah, know, I also know this. The Niel, so XY component of Niel, the XY the property component, that's the phase of the boson, not orders, that's it. Mm -hmm. that's okay. why we, we, we can look if at it. If you have some SZ component, 
that you know you could also say it coexists with the. Uh, okay, let me let me put it this way. I can add an extremely small term breaking the symmetry, and with adding this extremely small term to the Hamiltonian, it becomes just a soft. And you're also right that you can add an opposite term and yeah, that is it easy, easy, easy axis or easy plane? Yes, if yes, it's easy yes. plane, then it's going to lie in a plane as z zero. Right. And, but as uh, right, but I can always use such a representation by uh, uh, slightly breaking the symmetry when it becomes just a solid. That's right. When we say planes, well, when bonus point up, that's exactly when you have the imbalance of numbers, uh, you know, spin ups and spin downs. So so what, for the simulation, I would choose this representation. That's my point. Well, but at least you will work it in. Uh, so you have to work at the field fraction. How should I put it? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, we will have two types, well, n types of bosons. Mm -hmm. You have to have equal number of each of the types of bosons. Not necessarily equal. I can take them to different, and, and they will still be bosons. So I think a solid, I would imagine, is a balanced bond state. I actually don't quite know how to describe it as a bosons. I don't know how to describe it as a fermion, which is what I talked about. But I, I would say, say no I problem. With, uh, with, uh, with bosons, with this just means that you have currents. You, you have uh, uh, the symmetry, uh, symmetry breaking in terms of, say, Kinetic energy. So on some sides you have bosons. So on this, excuse me, bond, you have kinetic energy larger than on, on this. It, it, VBS in terms of bosons is straightforward. Well, okay, but maybe that's exactly the first. Uh, you know, that's a I think it's it's both on. You may still have a sign problem. There will be no sign problem. No, no, no. There's, uh, there's usually you have a flux. It's a boson flux. But in this case, you don't have a flux. flux. Well, if you it's that, a bipartite lattice. It's it's a square, if it's a square lattice, I don't But know. with a generalization, I'm not sure. On a triangular lattice, oh, I will have a problem. But here, the lattice was square. No, no, but what he's saying is it matters that there's flux per plaquette. Well, but that should come out, right? It's not in the Hamiltonian. Oh, it's not understand. in the Hamiltonian. It's not in the Hamiltonian that there's a flux per plaquette. It appears if it appears. OK, but here is I have this slide about possible numerics, which says that precisely that maybe there's a sign problem. And basically, everybody. Who I talk to, who does numerics, people like uh, Simon Treps and Matthias Truer, they all say, oh, of course, yes, I have a sign problem, I'm not going to approach this problem, but I'm not a numerics kind of person, so if there's no sign problem, it would be very interesting uh, to, to well, access that m equals one column, the column which lives by the experiment is in my previous slide. Uh, I would like to know if it's a chiral spin liquid, because people might actually do an experiment and see it, and since Topological state is such a big deal, you know, being able to tell before they do the experiment whether it's there or not there would be important. And maybe I'm just missing the origin of the same problem, because if the same problem is there, there is no intuition. Well, okay, so I don't know. I, don't, I simply don't know enough to uh, appreciate it. Okay, but so that's basically my last slides, and I already said everything which is on that slide many times over, so why wouldn't I just stop and you can read what's on that slide. Yes. So one thing which we can show is that if lattice is clusterizable, which means you can break it into clusters mm -hmm. which contain k sites which are maximally connected. All sites within the cluster are connected to all other sites within the cluster. Kind of like a graph which, is, which connects mm -hmm. everything. If you can break lattice into this kind of clusters, then large and limit always gives you uh, simplex solid states. So mm -hmm. each cluster will do mm -hmm. such such thing. So for example, you know, if it's triangle lattice as you three, yes, you'll automatically get this kind of things. But mm -hmm. even more, you know, if you, you know, I guess if you have a square lattice with things going across the diagonal, it's also clusterizable lattice. So I guess we also have balanced bond states even for a square lattice, but for those things it's even better balanced bond so it just kills everything. And, and so if you could work on such a lattice, then in principle you could make clusters of arbitrary size, depending on how you construct the lattice. So everything which I told you is done on the square lattice, because of how it's easy as lattice to do in the experiment. Well, we don't know what happens on triangle lattice, for example. I would imagine maybe something similar, but I, I, don't, I don't know. I can't even speculate. In any case, it's just open fields. You can come and start studying different lattices, and a lot of things can be done even right now. So does it mean that the lattice is not clusterizable in the sense that you might have some kind of commensal and commensal transition that may be the main separated by the main one? Well, but so a square lattice is not clusterizable as soon as k is larger than 2. 
And nevertheless, what we're seeing is that it's either valence bond type states or valence cluster type states up to k equal to 4 or Karas convicted. So we didn't see, we had competing states with some sort of uh, spin density order, but they, uh, they were high energy states. They were not the, the ground states of this human problem. And so that didn't happen at least in this paralysis, but maybe it happens on other lattices. Other questions? No? Okay, let's thank Victor again. Uh, so the morning's talk, I think it wasn't quite finished, so I mean, those yeah. of you who want to sort of keep on going, so I mean, you, you, can, you can just self-organize. Uh, well, I mean, it's, I mean, I cannot stay, I have to go home, family thing, but I mean...